is Monday, January 31st, meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. Um, pursuant to an act extending COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of the emergency, which was a really long time ago now, this meeting will be held using remote participation, so everybody knows um, the meeting is being recorded. No, that's not better, sorry. Do you need a minute, Barbara? No, I'm not. Do you want me to be muted? I can be muted. No, no, I just, I wanted to know if you needed another minute to kind of get settled. No, 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 no. I'm okay. Good. I'm good. Okay. I'm going to stop. It's, it is what it is. <laughs> okay, great. Well, welcome. Uh, we always begin the meetings with any public comment. Um, if there are those in attendance who have comments they would like to offer um, that are not related to anything that is already on the agenda, you're certainly welcome to voice those now. And I notice we have a two non-commissioned members attending. Um, are either of you uh, wanting to talk about something that is not on the agenda? We may have okay. a third, there may be a third joining. I don't know if people can be admitted late, but a, a third member of our group. Is of course, yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, so we'll wait to talk with you as we go down the agenda. Um, we do not, uh, approval of minutes is next on the agenda. We do not have any minutes to approve. Uh, excuse me. And there's a short shares ritual report. I did skip over that accidentally. Um, I just wanted to bring all those of you up to date who are not part of the SAMBA committee that's working on the Northampton Historic Preservation Plan. Um, it's Barbara and Steve and myself, and we did meet with Sarah on Friday. Mm -hmm. The day is just all blended together for me. Um, and uh, we got off to a fantastic start. Uh, Sarah had come up with a draft uh, scope of work for us to review, and we were, um, I would say, sort of flushed with comments. Um, so we will be meeting again in, I think on Thursday, it looks like, and uh, to refine. And um, the process then is to, at that point, um, begin to shape a request for proposals, which will be issued through the purchasing office of the city. And um, hopefully we have a proposal date of March 1st on this. I don't know if that's gonna be possible or not. It'd be great if it was, um, and we'll get that underway, so. If anybody has any questions for us at this point, um, we'd be happy to answer anything that we can. Um, it is an official public meeting, so anyone is welcome to attend other than the subcommittee members. So we see the group. Um, Steve or Barbara, um, would either of you like to just offer anything in addition? I'd just say um, it went great. And um, the document that we're looking at is a request for proposals. And so we're interested in hiring a consultant um, to be able to provide some professional services. But it sounds like that person or those people will be working closely with city staff and with nonprofits and other organizations in the community and with us. So picking the right consultant is a key issue and figuring out how to get the right consultant to apply through a good RFP is also a key thing. So that's what we're working on right now. May I just interrupt for a second? I'm sorry, I've been getting texts from our third member who says she can't get in or she sees the- Okay, I, okay. So her, her name was a, is a long string of random yes, yes, numbers. So I sent her a message <laughs> because I'm being careful about Zoom monitoring. Okay, that that, thank you. Um, I think one of the things that might be really good is that our next meeting, which will be at the end of February, uh, we can go over um, what some of the expectations are with everybody, just so you know uh, what we're thinking. Um, it's going to be a, a fascinating process and I think so incredibly useful for the city. So um, we'll stay tuned. Okay. Uh, we next have on the agenda um, requests for support for two CPA applications, I believe. And are those in attendance who are not commission members part of the groups that are making those requests? We are, uh, we are a group making one request. Okay. Uh, we have both the Laurel Park Association and the Miss Lawrence Diner. 
And Laurel Park is first on the agenda. Is there anyone or any of you representative of that group? Yes, there are three of us here. Um, Great. Sandra Matthews and my colleagues, Liz Duffy Adams and Laura Pravitz um, are here and we're all representing the Laurel Park Association. We live in, in Laurel Park, which is uh, um, a, a self-contained community within Northampton. And if you drive by on Route 5, you'll see a big mural that says community nature history. And those are the reasons that many of us choose to live in Laurel Park. Um, however, um, the details of, of our history are not known to all of us. We, uh, I, I think most of us who live here have a sense of history from our historic buildings that we uh, are, are living with all the time and using, um, but uh, um, the, the, the details remain um, buried in our archive and in the memories of, of a few people. And it's the 150th anniversary this year, 2022, of the founding of the community as a Methodist camp meeting um, site. Uh, the, the grounds were dedicated and the first services were held in August of um, 1872. And so since this is the, the 150th anniversary, um, uh, we in the Laurel Park Association are proposing to put up a group of six historic markers, um, five of them on our historic buildings and, and one to commemorate um, a, a, a significant event, the hurricane of 1938, um, uh, which uh, changed the landscape here. Um, so um, I have sent in a one page proposal. I don't know if any of you had a chance to, to look at it, um, but uh, perhaps I could share my screen at this point and show you what what we have. All right. Can people see my screen or not yet? Not yet. Let's see. Do I need to do some do I need to click share screen? Yes. Okay. So the, click the, the green button. Yes. Okay. Work. And desktop. Here we go. Now you can see my screen, maybe. Yes. Yes. Yes, we can. Great. All right. So, uh, so this is our one-page proposal. We, we we don't have. I assume we don't have to read every word now, or uh, I I can I can send it to you all. But uh, we're proposing to create and install six um, interpretive signs. Um, a little background about Laurel Park history. Um, and we have researched the signs and chosen to work with fossil graphics. Um, we were able to consult with the uh, people who put up the signs in Leeds and, and they were very, very helpful and they had had good experience working with, with um, fossil graphics who have given us a quote. Um, we plan to cover um, the costs of design installation and maintenance and are hoping are to are hoping to apply for a CPA grant to cover the cost of the signs or most of the cost of the signs themselves. Um, the buildings <coughs> brought along a few old postcards which show some of our historic buildings. Um, the, the gates to Laurel Park here with Normal Hall, which is our our oldest building was built in 1900. The tabernacle here, an earlier version, it's been, it was rebuilt in the 1980s. Another view of the tabernacle here. Um, uh, let's see. And this is a railroad station that no longer exists. Um, the trains brought thousands of people to attend the Chautauquas and camp meetings and some of our typical architecture that we live in is here. Uh, and an example of, uh, 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 of the kind of gatherings that were held in the um, late 19th and early 20th century during the, during the warm months in, in Laurel Park. Um, so those are just a few images that were made into postcards. Um, I also had sent out in advance a one page article. Um, this is transcribed from a Gazette article in 1872 that talks about the preparations that were being made 
um, uh, before the founding of the community a few months later, um, the preparations in June for the August founding. Um, so I'd be happy to, to circulate that to anyone who would like to see it as well. And we also have a letter of support from the homeowners at Laurel Park. Um, uh, so Laurel Park, the Laurel Park Association um, is dedicated to using our historic grounds and buildings for educational, uh, cultural and spiritual <coughs> purposes as a 501c3, but the homeowners at Laurel Park um, with whom we overlap, we're all homeowner owners, um, administer the community in other ways and they have lent their full support. Um, about how many people live there now? There are about a hundred cottages and, and most of them are very small. Um, so you, perhaps between two and 300 people. Okay, thank what you. What do you think, Liz and, and Laura? Do you have any other? I, I would like to <laughs> chime in here just to say that. So um, the Laurel Park um, Association, which has also been called Laurel Park Arts, this is the organization that we um, run as board members, um, host uh, events, annual events. We, you know, keep these Chautauqua um, festival alive in some form every year. Of course, it's been different with the pandemic, but we have always had as part of our vision, bringing outsiders into Laurel Park. And we do this through concerts and various mm -hmm. arts and um, events. We run religious services here and some of the different religious organizations hold their services in our tabernacle in the summers. Um, but I, I guess what I really am getting at is that when people do come into the park for the first time, there, there's like this looking around. Anybody who comes here is wondering, what is this? Or even passing by, you know, people say, I've always wondered what's behind those gates, you know. And there's just this real sense of when people sort of discover this buried treasure, this historic buried treasure with this, um, you know, charming, with all its charm and um, hearkening back to days gone by, they are really curious and want to know more. And, um, you know, I think that this putting these signs together will really <laughs> satisfy that need. And it will it will really mark the park as a historic landmark uh, that was that was tremendous in in its heyday. Thank you, um, Liz. Do you have anything you want to add to that since you're here as well? I'm I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer any uh, if there are any other questions. Um, I'm happy to pipe up, but I think that uh, I think that Sandra and Laura have covered the, the key points. Um, I think it's important to note that it is now a, a fully secular community um, okay. with, a, a, with a religious past. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the as a part of that history, having non-denominational or multi-denominational uh, groups come and hold services here as sort of a, a, a link to that past. Um, without, with no longer being strictly um, Methodist um, and, and sort of uh, shifting even more toward uh, cultural, historical and um, arts uh, programming as a part of the Northampton, greater Northampton community and trying, always trying to reach out and invite the, the larger community in to, in to enjoy it in the summers, especially. Uh, though we've been doing this year and last winter, we've done on online. We're about to in March and February and March. We've got a uh, 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 concert series on Zoom coming up as a winter Chautauqua, the virtual winter Chautauqua. Yes. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's about it, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you, all three. Uh, what questions do the commissioners have? Um, and this is, I would think, we should gear towards questions towards 
making a decision about whether we want to uh, lend our support to this application. And I'll talk about that in a second as a CPC representative from the commission, but do others have other comments or questions? I'm ready for a vote. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Well, I, I don't know if this is what you're going to bring up, Martha, but mm -hmm. um, uh, I know that the CPC is concerned about public benefit when it's a private group. Um, I mean, even though it's a nonprofit group that's asking for this. And I'm just curious. I mean, obviously in Northampton, presumably anybody can walk in any neighborhood. There are no gated communities here. Um, so are people welcome, say, to drive, park their car somewhere and walk around Laurel Park or um, you know, look at things so, so that any, I mean, I don't know how well known that is, but I just, I mean, I'm assuming, I, I knew it wasn't a gated community, but I just wanted to know, and that would be this sort of thing that I think the CPC would be concerned about. It certainly seems to me that this is very, um, a, a worthwhile thing to mark this again, because you're right, a lot of people don't know what the history of this community is. So I think it would be great to have um, these markers there for the really the benefit of the whole city, um, mm -hmm. even if it's not on the, you know, on the well-beaten path, mm -hmm. but this will raise awareness, I think, um, of, of, of this one section of, of Northampton and its history. Yeah, and Sandra, do you, do you wanna answer that question? Yes, we, uh, we are open to the public and people are welcome. Many people walk their dogs here, walk yeah. in from, from surrounding neighborhoods mm -hmm. and come walking their dogs through and um, the public is welcome. Right, and, and also if I could say one more thing, if these were shared with us, all these doc the documents you've shown, I apologize, I didn't see them in my email, but if they weren't shared, I really would be interested in, in seeing them so I could read them at another, um, you know, in the soon and also could you stop sharing your screen because it might be yes. easier for us to talk yeah, if we can sort of see each other right I, I'm only seeing the I, I, okay. there yeah. thank you I, I think that just makes it a little easier um, and would the best way to thanks. share with everyone be to send them to you Sarah and you would distribute I don't have everyone's emails but I have yes yeah, definitely and Sandra, I apologize I found these in my spam folder I don't know oh dear okay to send them there but I I do have these and I can send them out to everybody. okay I'll, I'll be um, happy to send and there are a couple of of new ones since okay yes yeah, so you can send those along and I'll add for the uh, benefit of the historical commission as well that Laurel Park is not currently listed on the National Register of Historic Places, although it, it certainly seems like it, it could be eligible and that might be a future project. Mm -hmm. uh, so the commission would need to determine that uh, Laurel Park is significant in the history, archeology, span architecture, or culture of Northampton. Okay. Um, Sarah, do you by any chance know whether there's been um, an inventory done of the property yes. and has it been um, determined eligible by the commission, by the Chabot, by Ms. Stork? I'm, I'm looking at the um, inventory form right now and it is, let's see, is there a date on it? It's, it's created on a typewriter. Okay, so um, 1970s probably. Received received by MHC April fifth, nineteen seventy six. There you go. Um, yeah. So, uh, well, does anybody have any other comments? Harvey, Craig, I know Jonathan. You're ready. You you've said what you want. Any anybody yep. else? I I used to live in Laurel Park back in the eighties. In fact, uh, I knew some of the people there that were original to Laurel Park. They've passed on now. And I was on the committee that tore down the original tabernacle. I'm sorry I didn't get nauseous when I was saying the word tear down because that's antithetical to what I believe in. But that building, that structure, the old tabernacle, which was an open air church, was much larger than the current one. In fact, if you go up there and you see this big open air structure where they have interdenominational services during the summer months, but the rows of pine trees in all four sides of that structure, whereas they mark the perimeter of the huge structure that is no longer there. Yeah. And uh, I would fully 
interpret this. I think it's, I think last time I was searching around on these Methodist campground communities, there was about a dozen or 13 of them. In Chautauqua, Chautauqua County in New York, in Western New York was where the movement started. And there's a kind of a famous one on Oak Bluffs on Martha's Vineyard. Mm. Laurel Park in Northampton is our cute little one here. And as I said, I lived there for a while back years ago, but I would be fully supportive of this because this is a treasure in our midst that's largely unknown. It's, as you mentioned, it is a somewhat mysterious, odd place sitting there, but it's um, over the years, it has become more and more fixed up. Um, the, it is the most affordable place to live in Northampton. Mm -hmm. And the uh, property management firm that is engaged with the condominium is really doing good work over years. And it's very affordable. It's a, it should be called out as something very special with the history here. And I'll mention that the uh, railroad went away in the 1920s on the whole branch line that was next to Route 5 today that went all the way up to Shelburne Falls was pulled out. And so the current width of Route 5 uh, is wider than it was years ago. It's just a horse path. And there was a, an actual branch line that did go up there, but it's gone. So there you go, stuff you didn't need to know. But... No, it's really oh, no. interesting, Thank Greg. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, Harvey, do you have any comments or? No, I think it seems great. Okay, um, just a couple of things, uh, you know, just some pointers about the W, um, w the CPA, CPC. Um, one of the things that we always wanna see is um, what kind of financial contributions you are making as um, part of the application. We, we rarely sort of fund a whole, cap, um, a whole application out fully fund all the money to pay for something. There usually is some kind of a contribution. So I would stress that. Um, Craig had mentioned how uh, there aren't a lot of these mod models left in the country or there aren't that many left. So I would maybe stress that too, like how important this is in that body of um, historic resources that it belongs to. So Oak Bluffs, I know you're right as one, I, I don't know others in Massachusetts, but I would certainly stress that. Um, and it sounds like the ownership is pretty clear. It's a condominium. So the land is jointly, the 40 acres are jointly owned by all the property owners, basically as part of this association. So that would be a question too. And also just to stress the public access part of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do really look at that very closely. And um, I think you articulated it really well tonight in the meeting. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. And then the only other thing I would really strongly um, urge your org association to think about, and we can work with you on this, is getting listed on the National Register. And as you know, that is not a um, restrictive designation. It's honorary, um, but it would give the the property, the organization, the people, you know, national significance. And I don't think you'd probably have any trouble achieving that if the application was, you know, professionally prepared. So mm -hmm. we're in the throes of um, such a process with uh, uh, the area in Florence that reflected the evolution reform movement. Mm -hmm. And this would be a nice sort of follow up, but just something to think about. And again, I think the commission would be, um, you know, certainly willing to work with you on it. So, um, so Sarah, do we need to vote? Any other comments? I have uh, one quick question, Martha, for you. Yeah. Um, is the support usually a, a come in the form of a letter that then goes with the application or what does that um, look it, like? It does. And um, as a representative, uh, I'm always asked to say a few words on your behalf. <laughs> Not that I always do that as well as I should, but um, it helps a lot to have these kind of conversations so I can sort of record in my mind what I can say to convey what people are thinking. Um, so yeah, the letter and then verbal support. Okay, and that's voluntary. Some applicants will come to us and others will not. It's just... There's no formal process by which anyone who applies for CPA historic preservation funds comes to the commission or how does that work? It's required in this instance, Steve, because Laurel Park is not listed on the National Register. I see. So th this is the eligibility trip for CPA funding. 
Okay. Um, but but some ap applicants seeking funds for projects that are already eligible don't necessarily come to the Historic Commission. Most I think. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to try to be really brief, but I'm strongly in support. I visited this site in 2010 as a circuit rider for Preservation Massachusetts and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I'm currently a neighbor to the site. I walk there all the time. Um, Sandra and I know each other because of a course at Smith that did some work at Laurel Park. Um, it, there's been conversation about its eligibility for historic designation for a while. So um, maybe there's a way to pull together some of these resources into that letter, even if it's just a few good paragraphs that makes a little bit of a step along the way for the rationale for our decision for the some of the things that Craig has cited in terms of being a, a well established historic context for understanding this type of designation. So I'm happy to volunteer to, in, in the interest of seeing more protection for the site and more recognition, I'm happy to, um, you know, put together a few paragraphs so that would be useful. That'd be great, Steve. It'd be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there, so we need to vote on its significance. It sounds like Sarah. Yes. And and as part of that, that would what the follow up to that would be the letter endorsing this application. Okay. So would someone like to make a motion, Jonathan? If why don't you do it since you were so anxious? <laughs> <laughs> I may, I make the motion to support support the proposal as it was as it was stated to us. In a second, Harvey? Okay. All right, any other discussion? All right, Sarah, we need a verbal vote. We do, uh, so roll call because we're meeting remotely. Steve? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Harvey? Thumbs up. Sorry, uh, yes. John Jonathan? Yes. Craig? Yes. And Martha? Yes. All right, unanimous. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all so much and good luck. Um, thank you all very much for, for all you're doing and for your support. Of course. Yeah. Now I'm going to make a special trip down there. Great. Do you okay. We'll <laughs> give you a, a personal tour. We'd love to. I would love to do that. Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't, it seems like if it's a hundred cottages, like that seems a lot bigger than the Oak Bluffs um, community. Am I wrong about that? Because I don't think of Oak Bluffs as being that big. They're, they're pretty squeezed together. It was yeah, but still, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't oh. know how big Oak Bluffs is. Mm -hmm. It's much bigger than you think. Yeah, I kind of had that feeling it kind of bleeds out from the central core of it, I'm sure. Yeah, okay, all right, enough. <laughs> Thank so, you all. You're welcome to hang around. We have a few more things on the agenda. Okay. I think we'll we'll depart and let you do the rest of your business, but um, thank you again. Okay. Good luck with the application process. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Bye. All right. The next item is the Miss Lawrence Diner sign. Uh, Sarah, um, there's nobody here to present. Do we have I any don't, documentation? No, we don't. So she was planning to attend the meeting. I don't know if something came up, but I don't have any details about what they're proposing other than a, a general plan to rehabilitate the neon sign. Okay. But I don't have details. They are part of the National Register because they're in the multiple resources, a diner, the diner designation. Um, so it's not required, but I think it would be hoove her to come and talk with us if she can before the uh, deadline, but the deadline is not is soon. Uh, yes, so it, that will be before the next meeting, but she, okay. she could always submit a letter of support during the right. review. Process. Yeah, that's true, okay. Well, I, I would recommend that she try to come in in February, um, just so we have an idea of what's going on. And um, <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I don't know this uh, CPC schedule in front of me, um, but the public comment period in that, does, I think it's not till March. We're not meeting the applicants until March. So I think that would be good to her for her to come in. It would be February 28th. Okay, great. Anybody other have anything to contribute before we move on? I, I'd just add that the um, proposed work would be really important, right? We'd wanna know um, for a designated resource what um, what they plan to do with the sign, who's who's working on it, that sort of thing. So um, could be great, but we don't know until we see some drawings or some description of the proposed work. 
Yeah, and it is a for-profit entity. So um, that does not make it ineligible for CPA funding, but um, it's a little unusual. Usually funding nonprofits, so. The really unusual thing about the diner is that there's a third party who actually owns the buildings. I'm wondering if the sign is actually owned by the diner leaseholder or is it owned by the building owner? Good question. Is that clear, Sarah? Have you? Uh, I, I don't know. And okay. Hopefully that will come out in the CPA application, but I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. All right, well, if there are no more questions about that, we'll move on. Um, we did uh, have circulated the draft historic uh, preservation section of the CPA plan. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to look at this. Um, this is different from the historic preservation plan that uh, Barbara and Steve and I are working on. This, this is part of a larger document that uh, guides the Community Preservation Committee. And obviously preservation is one part of it, but then there are also sections that deal with recreation, open space, um, housing, and am I missing something? Recreation, well, housing, housing, open space, recreation. Preservation. Yeah, that's it. So um, Sarah took a stab, We're, we are updating this, and Sarah took a stab at um, adding some language in here uh, focusing largely on um, the issue that came up recently with the Michelson Gallery uh, applying for Community Preservation Act funding as a private entity. Um, there was a lot of debate about this, a lot, a lot of debate about it, and a lot of mixed um, opinions about which way we should go with it. And I think um, what that prompted us to do uh, as a a committee is to think about okay how can we make if there are this you know the city is full of historic buildings many of most of them are privately owned um all the buildings in the downtown are most of them are privately owned um so if uh we open up our community preservation act funding to those property owners because they're historic buildings and they're in the downtown and they service the public um, what kind of restrictions, not restrictions, but requirements should we have for applicants coming to uh, the city for public funds to, you know, restore their exteriors of their buildings? That's it. Am I saying that right, Sarah, would you say? Yeah. Kind of? Yeah. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> um, so you'll so if you had a chance to look at this, there's a lot of text in red. And um, some of the things that we talked about was... Well, one, um, obviously adhering to the U.S. Secretary of the Interior standards. Two, um, most of the um, buildings that we have funded through CPC, CPA funding, um, have had historic structures reports done ahead of time. So we're talking about Smith Charities, um, obviously Historic Northampton, um, others, I'm trying to think of others. Uh, the Michelson Gallery did not go through that process. So that was, that came up as well, you know, do we really know what's going on with this building? Because they never really brought in any kind of preservation experts to look at it. They just got a quote from a Mason. Um, so that would be one thing that we would add to this as a, as a requirement. Um, And then Sarah also um, put in uh, information about uh, preservation restrictions, which is something that, you know, I think with Michelson, we're insisting that we do, we put a preservation restriction on it. So um, I don't know, that's kind of a snapshot. Does anybody, did anyone have a chance to look at this? Was it complete Greek? And, um, or did you have any comments? <laughs> no, I, I, I looked through it pretty carefully. You know, and I, I think in general, the additions are, are very good. Um, I, and I'll send a few, I didn't get a chance to send just a few typographical thing, you know, mistakes, spelling mistakes and things to Sarah in an email. But um, the part where you talk about the commission this is on page three, 
you know, you took out the language, does not receive any sitting funding through the budget process. And I think you don't necessarily have to add that language in, but I think it would be good. Where was I thinking? In the middle of the paragraph, the charge of the mayoral appointed committee, or mayoral appointed volunteer committee. I think it's actually good for people who might read this document to know that we're, I mean, I don't know, maybe people, people don't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily know that mayoral appointed means that we're volunteers. And I think, or even to say, to put back in that we don't get it, we, we have pr some private donations, but we do not have any funding from the city, even though we're charged with what we're charged for. And I think that's something that should be kept in there in some way with some language. Um, that was one thing. And on page four, what are you talking about here? Let's see. Oh, this is in, in the resources section. That's where that was too, I think. Um, when you talk in the last paragraph that you talk <clears throat> about a, la a lack of information of Forbes Library and other reference sources, I think maybe you should add the city assessor's records because they often have a lack of information as well. So I think people should understand that they are source, but they don't necessarily have great information. And at the top of that page four, I'm, I mean, I'm on the board of Historic Northampton, but I thought the official name was Historic Northampton, but I could be wrong that it's still listed somehow as the Northampton Historical Society doing business as, I, I don't know what that, what the accurate statement is, I could find out, but. Yeah, that um, I didn't know. That was, I didn't write the plan. Yeah, initially. I know that was so already was in there. Updates, so I, I, I think it was might, there. As long as, and I didn't see as long as we're checking on things, it might be useful to have that. Um, yeah, that would be great, Barbara. Have that change so I can check on that. And then what else was there? Again, a lot of these were, were some spelling errors or I think that was mainly what I wanted to say, those, those couple of things. Okay. Thank you. I have a question, Sarah. Um, is this part of like uh, a um, like updating of the Community Preservation Act Committee's um, manual, so to speak, or plan for like, does it include, are they doing the same thing for housing and the same thing for open space or are they just yes. looking at Preservation, okay. No, we're, we're updating the entire plan. Okay, and is city staff working on that or is the commission or both together or? Both, so I, I did an, an initial run through and updated things to reflect current practices and just added things that made more sense like the example with the private resources and historic, there were some other <laughs> items like that for the other program areas, um, updated, updated administration. So the process is that um, there will be a, a working session of the Community Preservation Committee next week, actually, no, this week, uh, on Wednesday, and then a sort of a, a final draft, but could still be up for revisions, will be uploaded to the website where people can take a look at it, and there will be a public hearing two weeks after that. So I should let the other commissioners know, I sent um, some, a track changes document to Sarah with some suggested ideas, and um, one of the reasons for doing that is that I think it's actually, um, maybe to Martha's point a little bit, introducing this item, um, really useful for the plan. So we already have in one place here, eight pages describing um, preservation policy in the city. Um, and it's been a long time since I looked at the existing text of the element within the comprehensive plan. Um, but I think this is more than that, actually. <laughs> and so it seems like this is really useful um, not just for communicating to that committee, communicating to the public, um, but it's the same kind of activity that we're engaged with and thinking about the plan. So, um, so I think it's well worth our time. <laughs> I guess I put it that way. And, um, and obviously the preservation plan when it's complete will inform this drastically and we'll need a lot of revisions at that point. Um, yeah. but it, was, it was just time to give the plan a, a little bit of, of an overhaul. Yeah, because I, I mean, I think to have this in one place and in eight pages of it that's updated to where we are in 2022, when that consultant starts, you can just hand it to the consultant and they have some background information to start with where they don't have to look at 15 separate documents. So um, it's the kind of thing that I think can be quite helpful. 
Um, and just and there are some things in there that have come. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say to just augment what you're saying. Um, I think one of the reasons that we were successful in getting funding for the preservation plan was because the other elements in CP. A, which are housing and open space and recreation, they have their own plans. There's we the city does an open space and recreation plan every seven years. It gets updated, and there's a housing production plan, and those are very active, you know, um, relied upon documents. And but we have never had one, but, you know, one that's really been, um, you know, meaningful and helpful. So, I think this is yeah. So that just a augment. So bad. I didn't mean to interrupt. Did no, you no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm thinking about, I mean, I, I, I don't think for our purposes tonight, it's useful to go through all those track changes, but um, uh, I am thinking about some of those questions and wondering, Sarah, how much you think would be useful, for instance, for me to share with the commission versus stuff that sort of text edits. I mean, let me maybe I can give one example. There was an issue that came up that we talked about earlier tonight, which is that properties that are not designated, it seems like under the Community Preservation Act, local commissions have the ability to make this um, finding, to take a vote, to say that something is historic. Um, that made me wonder, you know, are those properties then part of the city's inventory? Right. We use macros. We use this. We use the state's mm -hmm. inventory. We use the state system, the state's database. Mm -hmm. um, but now we're on record. We just took a vote saying that this is a historic property. What's sort of the legal status of that? And is that something that we might use for future planning purposes? So I think there's some things like that, which are a little maybe a little legalistic, but also kind of interesting to think about how these how these work together and um, how, um, how we describe that to the public, right? Because it's often quite confusing, all these different laws and commissions and ways of working. Yeah. Because before tonight, I was under the impression that it had to be a designated resource or one that was evaluated by the State Office of Historic Preservation. I didn't realize that the com commission had this ability to say, we see it as historic, so yes, it's eligible for CPA funds and yes, please go ahead. We're in support of the nomination. So it's, it's um, these small details I think are important to describe clearly to the public and to other commission members. Yeah, I, I, this really recognizes that there are some communities that have CPA that really don't have a lot of national register listed properties, but that doesn't mean that they don't have historic resources. Mm -hmm. So that it, this empowered communities to be able to make some funding decisions about uh, how CPA, which is a, a local initiative with Right. funded primarily with local funds can, um, can be used to. Yeah, I mean, it seems like a good idea because you're sort of supporting planning and survey efforts and, but it's also a sort of in-between level of designation. This, you know, Laurel Park is still not designated, but now we've gone on record saying we think it's historic. So um, my hope would be that they pursue National Register nomination and other designation and, um, but, um, we'll see. So that's certainly something that the CPC can, um, you know, recommend if they so decide to fund this, that, that we entertain that an application, a follow-up application is entertained for, for national register mm -hmm. listing. Um, so yeah, it's all good. All right. Uh, um, do folks have other comments about this? Um, you're welcome to attend our meeting on Wednesday night where we discuss all of this, as the CPC does. It's open to the public, as you know. Okay. Or the public hearing two weeks after that. Or the public hearing, yeah. That's true. There, comment. Will, there will be a, a more solid draft at that point. Great. Well, does you've done really good work on does this. Does this require an action from us? I don't think so. It does not. No. Okay. No, okay. All right, um, if there are no more comments on that, we will move on. Um, there is not an update on the Abolition and Reform District uh, National Register project tonight. Um, my, my error, I forgot to do that. That's okay. <laughs> um, we got such a great one the last time around. 
And we have the two um, Section 106 review applications. Now, the Mount Tom project, which is listed first here, we received this uh, information, I believe, at our last meeting or discussed it at our last meeting and uh, noted that we were not clear about what the historic resources were that were involved here. And they didn't come back with any additional information, right, Sarah? They didn't, no. So because this requires a, a federal permit and MassDOT is fairly early in the process, and this is pretty much what they have. They're not making an assertion that there is a historic resource involved, but they are required to go through the process before they get to their next design phase. So I would assume that archeological investigation would be part of this. If they didn't mention it, oh. probably not. Um, really? Okay. Review. I'm just surprised because it's right on the river. <laughs> I, I think it might be, they're reaching out broadly here because this is in a an area of the flood zone where this is, I was told internally at Mass DOT 25 years ago that this could never ever happen. This, that is to say, this stretch of road where it's low in relation to the, the railroad corridor, this could never be accommodating for bicycles because the road was too narrow and they never ever allow the shoulder, which is currently stone dust, a very permeable surface, they would never allow that to be paved. So I'm peakly interested with this because I'm wondering if they're actually gonna be redoing that stretch of road to be a, a wider asphalt with probably permeable asphalt. There's been permeable asphalt in place in several places, including a stretch of 128 and the uh, Walden Pond uh, National Park facility. That is a permeable parking lot there too. Water sinks right through it instantly. So what better place to be with a, a demonstrator project about permeable pavement in a, in a flood zone that is a we all have seen this road flood numerous times. And so I'm wondering if there's a, like a bigger issue in the background here, if they're gonna make this a multi-use trail with wider shoulders to accommodate bike, more biking down this, down this area. I'm wondering if permeable asphalt surface being installed. That's my take. Yeah, so it sounds like they're not they're not really in the design phase yet. I mean, they're in very conceptual design phase, schematic. This is the schematic that we have here. So, um, Sarah, can I ask a question about Section 106 consultation at this level? So, I mean, it seems like sure. the project is being undertaken by Mass DOT. The letter that we have is from a consultant working with them. Um, is archaeology within scope for the historical commission? You know, for instance, if we were going to say this is this is an issue, just want to flag it. So when it gets to the state office, uh, someone looks closer at it. Um, is that our role to like send a letter or something like that, or what? Yeah. What role so does the, the historical historic, commission play. The historic commission is advising Mass DOT in their not Mass DOT, Mass Mass Historic in their review. Uh, so you're providing advisory comments to the, the state historic preservation officer who's doing the, the actual section 106 review. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine that anyone would miss this after the roundabout by the co-op um, issue, right? right? Exactly. But on, yeah. the, but on the other hand, you know, it's a crazy time and people are busy and things go through and maybe someone, I, I just think we should flag it and say this is potentially... A, an archaeological, even if it's a three sentence letter, right? This mm -hmm. um, that archaeology came up as an area of potential concern, you know, something. Sure. Like that. Yeah, that, that's absolutely something the historic commission can talk okay. about. And there, Mass Historic is usually very attuned to archaeology just because the SHIPO, our, you know, our SHIPO officer is an archaeologist. I mean, it's Right. I mean, so yeah, my was impression was that Brana was much more interested in archaeology than oh. in landscapes or buildings. Absolutely. But that was 10 yes. years ago. So, yeah. yeah, I think that nothing has changed Steve, from what yeah. I understand. 
Okay. So that that would be, I, I agree. I think that's what we should do is to just flag that. So it doesn't appear to me that the um, modern road, so to speak, um, is a would be negatively affected by including um, a multi-use lane, but um, it's the it's the archaeology component that I would just be very surprised if there weren't archaeology archaeological um, artifacts evidence here. Um, so. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions or comments about it? We have another one, which is the um, Verizon wireless antenna that is being proposed for the top of Flor uh, Thorns Market building. And we don't have much more information about this. I mean, there's not even really a description of it. Um, this is also going to have to go through downtown business architecture review. Um, so what, Sarah, what do you, what, what do they want from us? Uh, so this is essentially the same process as the Mass DOT review. Right. So this is a section 106 and the commission would be advising Mass Historic as part of their review. This, um, because it's a communications tower, it, has, it needs an FCC permit. So that's right. the federal trigger for section 106. So one thing that I would be concerned about is, is visual intrusion on the downtown streetscape. And I don't know from what they've submitted, it's impossible to know what they're actually gonna do. Yeah. I have a, a question though, because I, I went downtown to try and see, because I, I was confused by the plans that they sent where this antenna is going to go or where the antenna is it's going to replace, because, you know, Thorns goes back so far and then the building's kind of at, a, you know, per, um, 90 degrees or whatever to the building you see on Main Street. But, but I looked and the, when I was at the top of, what was it, Main Street and Old South Street, if you look like on top of the part of the building where Harold's and um, Paul Elizabeth's restaurant is, you can see some towers right there, some antenna. And are they proposing to replace the ones that are there, those? And also, I don't see how those were ever allowed because you can, they're really visually, you can really see them from the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, if they were there further in, but I don't know if they were, if those are the ones they're talking about replacing, if the ones they're gonna replace are gonna be even bigger. Some, it did seem like their drawing, it was out that far, like towards South Street, but I really found it hard to tell. It would have been nice if they had indicated on the plan better what part of the building it was or where you would see it. But I, I sort of walked around, I was in the parking lot and you really, from the parking lot or the garage, you can't really see the top of that building. It was really only when I was, on Main Street, and even when I was across Main Street in front of where Faces was, you really couldn't see anything on top of that building. But I just wondered if the, the place in question is where these horrible, ugly antennas already are. So if you look at sheet C3, uh, they have a comparison of an existing um, you know, I don't alpha have that. sector antenna yeah, plan and then a proposed alpha sector antenna plan. Yeah. So it looks like it, okay. it's a replacement of what's already there with a little bit of a visual change. Um, right. Not a change in overall size. Right. But, but it's the ones that you can now changes. see they're proposing to replace. I believe so. Yes. Okay. So, so yeah. not the one. So we're a little bit farther back towards the parking. Oh, you're a little farther back. Not the ones that are right visible, like but above I, above Paul Elizabeth. I mean, There's a question on this regard. Yeah. If you look at where they circled, uh, it's can not. Can you share the screen or something? Because I, I, yeah. I didn't print out those documents. I looked at them, but. I, didn't, yeah. I don't have them in front of me. Sure. So if you look at where they circled here, um, you know, here's here's Main Street. So it's farther back towards the parking garage here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here's existing yeah. and proposed. I can't imagine these are supposed to be different places, but the drawing on the left has two lines two horizontal lines in it, and the drawing on the right has one horizontal line, which implies that it could be in a different place. That would be weird to me. Mm. Yeah, good point. Um. I have a question about this. Mm. The, mm. I remember Verizon asking to put an antenna, cell phone antenna tower 
at the DPW yard on Locust Street. They got never built. They went through the process, but it was never built. Is there any, uh, a, there's now a hole in their cell phone network, by the way, in that area of the hospital and, and part on Locust Street. But just very odd that they never built it out. I never really thought about it until we're talking about this tonight. And Sarah, do, do they ever explain why they've never built something and they got through the permitting process? I don't know. I don't remember that permit coming through. Uh, so I, I don't actually know if that what happened with that or if it got built or not. Sometimes alternate locations are selected. I know they there is a cell phone tower on city property at the Smith Oak Forest. Hmm. Well, I would say to evaluate this properly, um, I, yeah, I think we need to have more visuals. I, it's just, it's very hard for us to tell from these plans exactly how, you know, what the vertical component of this is going to be, what it's going to look like from different angles. And I would think the business, uh, down in business architecture would have the same problem. Yeah, so they'll definitely require more detailed information. Mm -hmm. um, Section 106 process is time limited. So if you do want to make con uh, comments to the State Historic Preservation Officer, even if the they're based on limited information, I would just go ahead and agree to do that now. So just to give them something to consider and, and look at so you're not completely left out of the process. Okay. So, you know, many places, they, they make the pro project proponents launch a balloon that is stationary at the proposed height of the project. I don't think we've ever had that around here, do we? Uh, not for an attachment to an existing structure. I think there have been cases where sort of a mock-up was placed or some computer renderings, but not a balloon for this type of project. Any other comments, questions? I would just um, speak in favor of writing a letter. Again, even if it's three sentences and to say, it's a designated historic resource it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1976. Thorns is a highly visible, well-known building at the center of this district. There's a change in elevation from the roadway and the surrounding areas. Um, and, and this rooftop is um, uh, clearly seen. And so um, at a minimum drawings, I mean, so, so there's a potential issue, please investigate. But if we're making recommendations, you know, I would say, please send some plans which label the surrounding streets, <laughs> like what streets are we looking at, right? And uh, conduct a sightline study, just as Craig is indicating, whether you use a balloon or whether you do that with a rendering or, or, or an elevation drawing, right? Um, so um, at a minimum, I think we would say, we see a potential issue here and a potential adverse effect. Um, more information is needed. The Section 106 reviews are funny because they're, it's not actually a submission to the city. We're sort of being copied on it. Um, yeah. Courtesy almost. So it, unless the commission jumps on what limited information there usually is to be able to make a comment. It, it's, right. It's easy to be left out. Right. And we don't have it. I mean, yeah. it's we're advisory in an advisory process. <laughs> we're like two steps from there, you know what I mean? But I think just to say we see, we see, an, we see a potential issue here. This is... Mm -hmm. It's a significant, a significant building in a designated historic district. So, could, could we it, also? Sorry, could oh, we I, also? I was just going to add that. Um, oh, it, so it, it will need to go through the central business architecture process. This is not the submission that will end up um, being decided on by CDAC. They will need more information than this. But could we suggest that you know if they haven't thought about it, or I mean, not that they might, you know, they might anyway. But just suggest to them that you really, they really need this ele either elevation or something in place to simulate where it would be that they need to ask for that. You know, we found it lacking, and so we recommend that they ask for it. Yeah, I see. think that's, that's a real good. Is it this, 
is it supposed to be the same elevation as the current current one? I, I was trying to look at that. I could I could Yeah, it wasn't clear it's to really me. It's really hard to tell. It really wasn't clear to me at yeah. all. Don't what we say. Got. I don't I don't recall if it said I read that one a, a number of days ago, so I don't recall if it said uh, that, but on I that remember sheet, not being I remember not being sure. A lot of marginal stuff on that sheet that I just was I say on my I I y'all got a more of a good glimpse of my forehead than I wanted to give you because I tried to get it in the books. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the, the drawing, Harvey, that you um, specifically were talking about, we have no idea where that is on the building. Um, okay. It could be in the basement for all we know. Um, <laughs> what the, well, we do have the orientation, but that's also really hard to um, square with the aerial they have because there's no um, orientation on the aerial, I'm presuming it's north, but I don't know. So anyway, yeah, it's, it's very vague. Um, and I think Mass Historical, they should absolutely ask for all of this information um, so the central business can ap appropriately comment as well. Okay. Um, any other business that um, is unforeseen when the agenda was um, developed? Anybody have anything else they'd like to talk about tonight besides the weather? Oh, it was a dud here. <laughs> I went cross country skiing and it was like doing it on ice because there wasn't enough snow between the ice and me. Uh, but anyway, no. Um, but I, I had mentioned this, I think, to, to Sarah and um, Martha that with this uh, form based zoning changes, and that I was somewhat concerned with the central business district purview that that was going to change, that some buildings would be um, taken out of their purview and maybe some others put in. And I just wanted us to be aware of that. I didn't know whether we had to comment on that. Um, uh, so I don't know if we resolved whether we needed to be concerned because I know that isn't that coming before city council really soon? Uh, yes, there was a forum last week in city council, I believe. Has right. there this week. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we talked about this in our subcommittee group about how um, we don't. The Center for Business Architecture um, Committee is separate from us, and I know when the um, the St. John Cantius issue was on the table, um, it was very confusing to the public you know, why we weren't more involved. Um, because even though the CBAC's um, purview is a little, or focus is a little different, you know, their design review, um, they're dealing with historic buildings. So that's all they do. I mean, all the buildings in the downtown, except for a couple are historic. So um, it was just a question that we raised about, you know, why is, how is it that um, the CBAC is not under the historic different, different his commission's jurisdiction. Um, and you know, possibly something that the planning process could look at because it is confusing. So just something to think about. Yeah, I think I think this is a key issue for the plan and something worth talking more about. What is the relationship between the two commissions? And I noticed in the in the draft document um, related to Community Preservation Act, there's a reference to the local historic district as MGL 40C or something like that, right? That's the label, the adjective that's applied. Um, and I get the fact that the, the architectural conservation district is um, created under separate city ordinance, but it does raise the question of what is the sort of state um, structure for that? And it seems like there's probably some more for all of us to learn about how they're related. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, who would, I have who a would lot have, of questions. About who it. would have the responsibility of moving this forward? I'm hearing the questions, uh, which we're obviously not going to resolve tonight, but who, who would move this forward? I, I think it would just be something for the preservation plan consultant to look at and make some recommendations. So we want to make sure that that consultant does do that, right? Yeah, and that was one thing that we talked about, Jonathan, as a group, is that um, this planning process is 
you know, likely because of the preservation needs that we have in Northampton are, um, they're complicated. Um, you know, it's not just about inventorying and figuring out what we have yeah. in our historical collection. It's about, you know, what is the best way to balance um, preservation with um, the needs for affordable housing, the need to keep the economy going, um, all, the, all of these things that we talk about as a community and preservation, you know, needs to be part of that and a really key part of that. But that um, cross, you know, and then you start crossing over into issues like zoning and review, you know, here we are with the downtown business district review. And so the consultant really, I think, who, who comes on board for this has got to have some expertise in that area, or at least their team does. Um, so it's- so My only question was who about, maybe it's you, Martha, has to make sure that, the, that that's on the consultant's radar. Yeah, our committee will. That's what we're involved with. Okay, okay. Involved with. That's, yeah. I'm, that's good enough for me right now. <laughs> okay. Glad you have some confidence. Um, okay, great. Um, if, does if anybody, anybody else, Barbara, you have any more thoughts about that? It's, I think it's really important. It's really great you brought it up. No, no, no. I think that's good. I just wanted the full committee, commission, to be aware that this had come yeah. up and it was on our radar for the preservation plan. Yeah, great, thank you. All right, anybody else? Harvey, Craig, Steve, Jonathan? If not, um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn at 6.30. Oh, so, so one, moved. Wait, I have one oh, quick oh, extra item. Um, so not <laughs> moved. Yeah, I it's not. Correspondent. So I didn't have, we just got it today, so I didn't have time to scan it and send it to everybody. Um, but it's a letter from the, um, Person, the National Register Director at MHC, who is Ben Haley, um, to Epsilon Associates, and he's letting them know that the National Register nomination for the Clark School for the Deaf has been scheduled for consideration by the State Review Board on March 9th. So that's moving forward. Great. That's excellent. Hey. I mean, that was how, uh, that's been in the process for a long time. Yes, uh, 10 years, I think, just about. Oh, wow. Sarah, is that the last step in a historic tax credit project? Or is it? It is. Yeah. Yes. Certification. Yeah. OK. Exciting. Yeah, that's great. All right. Uh, 638, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, I put my motion back in. I will Thanks. second that. OK, great. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Thank Bye you. Everybody. We'll meet again on the 28th. Yeah. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.